you, AZ. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me loud and clear. Uh, so for today's session, uh, we are going to look at how we can implement some of the big data scenarios with the various Hadoop options on Azure. Right. Um, so with that, uh, I'll start the session. Uh, it will be a uh, very hands-on oriented session, so if you want to follow along, you are most welcome to. In case you face any um, uh, issues or have questions, uh, please, uh, you know, as AZ explained, use the question answer panel uh, so that AZ uh, gets to see the questions and pass it along to me as appropriate. So I'll try to answer as many questions during the session, but uh, if I'm unable to uh, answer during the session, I'll also answer some of the questions. Uh, I'll keep some time after the session uh, to answer uh, many more questions. So with that, uh, as I said, uh, this is going to be a pretty hands-on oriented session. So if you have a Azure account, uh, this will be a good time to spin or log into that account. Or if you want, uh, Azure provides a pretty generous uh, evaluation if you haven't used Azure before, um, you should uh, try that out. So this will be a good time to go check that out. Now, uh, as I said, there are many options to deploy uh, Hortonworks data platform on Azure. Uh, we have HD Insight, which is a software as a service offering. We also have uh, HTTP on Azure, uh, which is a multi-node uh, distributed cluster on top of Azure. And then uh, we also have Hortonworks Sandbox. Now for today's uh, demonstration, we are going to use the Hortonworks Sandbox. And the reason is that you know, Hortonworks Sandbox has all the features, but it is a great kind of, a, as the name suggests, sandbox for developers and uh, you know, uh, hackers uh, so that they can try out their scenario without spending a lot of uh, money on Azure. So if you go to hortonworks.com slash sandbox, uh, you can, uh, there's an option to also download the VM, but I would uh, strongly encourage you to, uh, you know, uh, use your Azure account to spin up sandbox on Azure. Now with that, let me show you how to do that though. Uh, so let me stop the presentation. Let me go to the, uh, Azure portal. So this is my Azure portal. Um, uh, again, uh, let me know if you can or cannot see the screen. Uh, I'm, I hope you can. Uh, so uh, here, if you go to search and just uh, search for Horton Works, uh, actually you go here. That's I'm searching my existing resources. So this is what lets you search the. Uh, search the marketplace. So you see the first option that comes up is Hortonworks Sandbox with HTTP 2.4. So that's what you want to select. Uh, if you click here and say create, then in just a few steps, in literally five steps, it lets you uh, deploy um, Sandbox which you can um, play with. Uh, now. Um, Remember to uh, note down the username passwords. Many of uh, the users, the common mistake is that uh, you know it's easy to forget the passwords and username, right? So you won't be able to log in. So once you complete these five steps, you will have a sandbox running. Now in my case, I already have this running here, right here, right? So once I have this running, you'll see that I'm just uh, it's running on a single VM with two cores and 14 GB of uh, RAM, and that's good for what we are going to do today. Um, so uh, at this point, let me switch back to the presentation and show you the next thing that you would want to do to get ready to follow along. So uh, once you have the sandbox on Azure, uh, you can then download the instructions from this link here, right? So this has detailed instructions for the entire lab that we are going to go through and explain and brainstorm around uh, in this session. So you know, even if you don't finish it 
in next one hour. I know it's a short amount of time, and then I'll try to go really fast. But uh, you know, uh, make sure you play with it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's basically consuming tweets, uh, filtering them, uh, doing various kind of um, uh, analytics on them. So it's a lot of fun. So if you, you just need to follow along. Now with that, let me go to the uh, present rest of the presentation. In the meantime, I'm hoping I uh, you know if uh, you uh, girls and guys want to play along, are spinning up the Hortonworks sandbox on Azure, right? And also, uh, please note down this uh, uh, link, which will give you the step-by-step -step instructions. Now. A little bit about Hortonworks. Uh, as AZ uh, said, that we are the only 100% open source Hadoop distribution out there. And in fact, uh, this is the team which, uh, when they worked in Yahoo, created Hadoop in the first place, right? Uh, later, Yahoo spun it off in 2011 as a separate company. Of course, Yahoo is one of our uh, major customers and supporters and investors currently, but we have uh, literally, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, customers, and we have um, you know, we are the only public company who's um, uh, you know who has a Hadoop distribution, and then we uh, we have over 2,000 technology partners. We have uh, over 1,000 employees. We are available in. Uh, 17 countries. We are, uh, you know, much more than 100 million dollars in uh, revenue and so on. Also means the quality of our partners and the uh, partnerships. For example, with Microsoft, we have been partnering since 2011. We have co-engineered HD Insight and uh, you know many other peripheral pieces uh, together very closely with market leaders like uh, Microsoft. Now, um, enough about Hortonworks. Uh, let me go to some of the scenarios that uh, I, I promised I would cover. So one very common scenario is Internet of Things, right? And Internet of Things doesn't need to be just data coming from sensors. Of course, that's a very, very uh, important uh, you know, uh, type of Internet of Things, but it could be mobile phones, apps in your uh, uh, apps running on mobile phones in your pockets. It could be even uh, uh, you know sensors in your shoes or in your uh, watches in your uh, uh, um, for for uh, industrial appliances. For example, uh, Coca Cola has this uh, machines which they call freestyle machines where you can uh, you know, mix uh, and match your own soft drink in, uh, with various flavors, they have a lot of sensors. So you, basically anything you can think of nowadays pretty much has sensors in them and IP in them and is generating data. So that creates a whole new, you know, um, challenge so to say. Uh, before, we didn't have to deal with not just this volume of data, but how do we manage this data flow end to end um, across uh, various kind of uh, links, right? So you, you would um, imagine, let's say, if there was a Coke vending machine, um, you know, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of Amer America or uh, you, you know, take your pick of any continent, South America or India or uh, s some other place, you can't assume that there will be a, you know, uh, consistent bandwidth and latency across the uh, network connecting to those devices, right? So you need to be able to uh, deal with those kind of uh, situations. So handling data flow end to end uh, across this kind of various kind of uh, uh, situations is very, very important. Of course, data at rest, uh, we know, has always been important. And that's uh, 
one of the reason the core pieces of Hadoop was created. Of course, as after the core pieces were created, people found many more uses and the community kept enhancing it. And we are going to talk about that um, uh, in more details in a uh, future slide. Now, at the intersection of the data in motion and data in rest is the actionable intelligence. It's, uh, in a, it's about, you have historical data which is stored in, uh, uh, you know, which is the data at rest, which is stored in on HDP. And then you have um, uh, streaming data uh, across all these various kind of uh, infrastructure. Um, which uh, uh, you have to, um, you know, if, if you think of it, if you want to think of it simplistic, uh, simplistically, you want to join with the historical insight to create some actionable intelligence. Now, um, I, I mentioned HDF. Uh, HDF stands for Hortonworks um, uh, Data Flow. Now, Hortonworks Data Flow is a uh, um, uh, relatively newer uh, uh, technology, but I'm going to talk about it in a lot more detail uh, and, and explain it what it does. In fact, we are going to see some demo of uh, you using that uh, with HDP um, on Azure. Now, here are some common use cases for uh, you know data in motion and data in rest. Uh, uh, a platform, right? So you, you can have real-time cyber security, right? Uh, so it's a very, very common use case where you want to protect whether uh, you are getting events from servers or events from um, network devices, routers, whatnot. Uh, you would want to kind of um, analyze the streaming in data and with the historical insights you have, you want to um, uh, protect your infrastructure, right? Smart manufacturing is again a very, very uh, common use case we see. Connected and autonomous cars, right? So this is again, uh, pretty much every car manufactured today, uh, if, if you, I don't know if you know about it, is uh, connected. You know, there are our dealers and manufacturers knows the various metrics on the car. Uh, at any any point in time. Uh, farming, right? So there are sensors in the soils, in the fields, and you want to, uh, you know, uh, design your, the release of uh, nutrients in terms of fertilizers, the release of, um, you know, uh, water in the sprinkler system and whatnot. You want to take preventative uh, uh, measures against pests and everything, right? So th this kind of farming um, uh, infrastructure is now uh, connected and uh, much, and thereby uh, resulting in much more productive uh, fields. Automatic uh, uh, recommendation engines, and we have all used recommendation engines, right? So whenever we go shopping online or uh, nowadays even <laughs> um, uh, when I walk uh, with my cell phone into a mall, I get alerts on my phone based on who I am as to uh, discounts I should kind of take advantage of in the various shops in that mall. So that's already uh, happening and, and, uh, and this kind of a data infrastructure makes it possible. Now, when we think about data flow, we often think the data only flows from the sensors to the you know the store, the item potent store, uh, where the data doesn't change, and we can do all kinds of analysis uh, into you know, once the data gets to the data center. But the interesting thing uh, trend is that it's not just the data is not flowing one way. I'll give an example. Um, I was. Uh, a few years back, I was working on a project with the uh, United States Geological Survey, and they distributed this uh, little sensors of the size of a cigarette pack to various homes uh, in California. And once you kind of strap those little devices on to some kind of a uh, sturdy pole or something uh, in your garage, um, they would pick up very even very faint seismic activity. The idea was that they, 
they are getting all this streaming data and that would let them better predict earthquakes or other catastrophic seismic uh, events right so they were getting a lot of uh, false alerts because all, on all these sensors uh, there uh, you know there are different thresholds of seismic activity and if the seismic activity cross those um, thresholds then it will uh, you know throw an alert but uh, as trucks were passing by during commute hours or whatever it is right uh, somebody drove a hammer by and then you would, that would ge generate enough seismic activity in the neighborhood that it will throw false alerts so they needed to kind of create a system which can uh, you know uh, um, push back the context and the commands back to the sensors to kind of uh, calibrate them on the fly for those thresholds, the right thresholds, so that they are minimizing this kind of um, uh, false alerts. And Hortonworks data flow, which is uh, based on a technology called Apache NiFi, actually lets you do that. Now Hortonworks data flow uh, it has a very visual interface. Uh, it provides immediate feedback, so you can change the data flow uh, in real time uh, without having to disrupt it, without having to take down the, all the infrastructure, roll out a new, um, you know, uh, program and so on. It's it's very uh, you can very visually change the whole uh, data flow. Um, it's adaptive to volume and bandwidth. That's really, really important because we can't assume uh, that the volume will be constant. Uh, there are certain times when we get a lot of data. There are other times we don't get a lot of data. And there needs to be ways to manage when we have these spikes, right? Uh, there uh, Often it leads to back pressure, right? So if you uh, think of it, uh, of any data flow as kind of a pipe, or a queue, right? So when a lot of data is coming in uh, and you're not being able to process at f as, f as fast, uh, you end up with um, uh, a queue length uh, becoming bigger and bigger. At that moment, you need to be able to deal with this back pressure. Um, so also the event level data provenance is uh, super important. So. Uh, in today's day and age, uh, understanding uh, how the data has changed as it flew or uh, flowed through the organization is very important, right? Um, so um, uh, again, uh, a security of, is of paramount inter, uh, importance because uh, with all the you know, uh, security incidents that we hear about today uh, means there is no organization that can afford to have a weak link in their chain, right? So their data flow should be encrypted, should have fine gain uh, um, uh, grain control on who can see, who can uh, do, act on that data and so on. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Hortonworks data platform itself. So Hortonworks data platform um, you know, in, at the core comprises of HDFS and then um, uh, the YARN. Um, uh, YARN stands for Years Yet Another Resource Negotiator and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a uh, future slide, in a few slides. But that, think of it as a data operating system. On your data infrastructure, you require various kinds of applications. You, you require batch applications, you require interactive applications, you require um, you know, machine learning, you want to do search, you want to do real time, you want to do in memory. So there needs to be a common um, uh, kind of a uh, piece of the infrastructure which enables you to share your cluster resources across all these applications, right? And Yarn uh, lets you do that. And uh, you know all, all the various types of uh, Hadoop that we are going to 
I shouldn't say all the various types of Hadoop, but all the deploy, various deployment models of Hadoop that we are going to discuss shortly all share this common infrastructure. Um, now, also you want to govern, uh, do governance on this data infrastructure irrespective of what kind of application you are running in a, in a consistent way. You want to manage the security of this data infrastructure in a very consistent way. You want to manage the operations of this uh, infrastructure in a very consistent way. And that's what Hortonworks data platform brings to the table, right? It provides a set of open source frameworks which unifies governance, security, operations across uh, all these various components, right? So uh, for, for a specific use case, you might use one or the other component um, that you have, but the way you manage security, the way you operate it, the way you uh, monitor it, the way you um, deploy it, the uh, way you do data governance on it should be uh, consistent. Of course, uh, th there are many, many deployment choices and many ways to interact with this infrastructure, uh, irrespective of whether you are using Excel, you are using Tableau, you are using um, other kinds of uh, uh, data infrastructure that you already have in your organization. Now, uh, Hortonworks does a tremendous amount of work with the Apache community to make all these various components possible in, in our whole data infrastructure, right? So we have the majority uh, number of committers that uh, work on all these various projects, so thereby kind of we influence uh, we have, uh, the community and work with the community. We are kind of the um, uh, enablers of the community, right? Uh, now let's talk about a uh, little bit about the various deployment options. So uh, we have a, a very robust hybrid story. So you can have HTTP on Linux or Windows in your data center. You can have HTTP on your appliance, whether it's a appliance from Microsoft, Teradata, or uh, many other uh, appliance vendors, or on the cloud, uh, whether it's, uh, of course, Azure, um, uh, Amazon EC2, Rackspace. Uh, we also have a, a SaaS offering around um, HTTP, which is Microsoft HD Insight on Azure. Uh, we also support all the various kind of virtualized uh, deployment options like VMware, Docker, OpenStack, and so on. So let's look more into the various deployment options on Azure. Now one we just kind of briefly saw, right, the HTTP sandbox on the marketplace. Now it's a great environment for developers and, um, you know, hackers to kind of uh, try out various ideas. It doesn't consume a lot of resources. You can run it on a single VM, uh, whether it's on Azure or you can run it on your own machine if you're if you have a beefy machine. But uh, uh, we also have other, uh, you know, uh, production grade deployment options. One is of course HDP Azure infrastructure as a service. Uh, in the marketplace, right? So you get multi-node HTTP on um, in the marketplace. Now this is the only uh, Hadoop IaaS offering which today can uh, take advantage of the Blob Store and the Azure Data Lake. Uh, we also have, of course, HD Insight. Now HD Insight is fully supported by Microsoft, and we kind of uh, uh, handle the Tier three support at the back end, with along with Microsoft, um, and it's a pass offering, so platform as a service. So your management and uh, maintenance overhead dramatically goes down, right? You can very easily spin up nodes. You can use the Azure API, uh, and it's uh, fully integrated with uh, Azure Blob Store and. Um, Azure Data Lake. We also have the fourth option, which is uh, a technology called CloudBreak. Now, CloudBreak 
provide a cloud agnostic way to deploy Hadoop on uh, any of the cloud options or other virtualization options, right? Like Docker or OpenStack, right? So with that, uh, let's see what people use Hadoop mostly for. So uh, a very common uh, you know, use case for Hadoop is to do cost optimization, to decrease the amount of money the organizations are uh, spending um, uh, with their increased demand for a scale-out data infrastructure. So um, many organizations today have uh, traditional data warehouse appliances and so on, right? But those are great, uh, you know, data uh, platforms, but they can get really, really expensive really fast. And especially, it's hard to kind of keep up with the growth of the data. So that's where uh, with, uh, you know, very close Hadoop integration with all these appliances, whether it's from Microsoft or Teradata or others, um, you can very easily offload and archive many of um, the workloads from your traditional data warehouse appliance to um, uh, Hadoop. Also, Hadoop is a great uh, distributed ETL platform, right? Uh, again, I used to be in SQL Server, and I love uh, SQL Server integration services, right? SSIS. It's a great ETL platform. Um, one of the common complaints we used to hear from customers is, "Hey, can I scale this out?" And you know, Hadoop provides a great scale-out ETL platform, irrespective of which vendor you have your rest of your data infrastructure for. So that's, again, a very common use case. The third use case is the enrich the value of your enterprise data warehouse. There are certain kinds of data, for example, log data, uh, for example, data from IoT uh, kind of devices and so on. Um, uh, you know, they are better, uh, they work better um, on the Hadoop platform because Hadoop platform is best better in dealing with a semi-structured or unstructured data. And then when you marry that with your traditional data warehouse, the uh, value of your uh, enterprise data warehouse just kind of uh, uh, skyrockets. So here is a case study when, uh, with one of our customers. By the way, we have uh, you know quite a few customers. Pretty much all the telecoms in North America um, are our customers. Uh, you know, seventy percent of the retailers are Hortonworks customers, and and so on. So, uh, but this is just one. Uh, case study, it's a public case study, you can look up uh, more details about it, just you know, uh, Google or uh, Bing, um, uh, Hortonworks and TrueCar and you, you'll get more details. Where in just 12 months, they uh, um, grew from a very small cluster to a 60 node, 2 petabyte cluster. Their storage costs plummeted from um, uh, $19 per gigabyte to $12 uh, dollars per gigabyte. One of their execs actually said that, you know, uh, betting on Hortonworks data platform as their core enterprise data platform was crucial uh, for, uh, uh, for them to achieve their IPO within 12 months of betting on this platform. Now, um, I talked a little bit about Hortonworks data flow. Now, as I said, every everything that we work on is uh, truly open source. So we open source the technology uh, behind Hortonworks data flow. It's called Apache NiFi, uh, and uh, NiFi stands for Niagara Files, and the, the uh, yeah, you know, genesis of this technology is was in NSA National Security Agency, where they had this these challenges which we discussed uh, to understand the provenance of data to have to have security around their data flow, to uh, be able to deal with various rates of data flow, various kinds of network infrastructure. So they developed NiFi, and and then the team spun out 
um, into a separate company called Oniara, and then we acquired that company Oniara, and uh, now it's a uh, you know top level Apache project. Now the common use cases are like predictive analytics, compliance, IoT optimization, fraud detection, big data ingest, value resources, right? Um, and again, uh, the reason I'm going a little fast is that I want to get to the demo. So if you have questions on any of these slides, please free, uh, feel free to kind of ask questions and I'll take those. Uh, one of the most common um, uh, use case is log optimization, right? So often uh, there are various log analytics platform. Uh, traditionally, they have scalability issues or they are extremely expensive. And uh, HDP married with HDF, uh, as we discuss, can become a perfect complement or a replacement of this kind of platforms. I spoke about a little bit about the yarn uh, or and the, and the heart of Hadoop. Uh, data platform, um, with some of the things that it enables were, is multi-tenancy, right? Multi-tenancy means various organizations or departments can share the same set of resources. That just results in better utilization of your resources, of your investments, right? Um, and, and many of the top vendors, including Microsoft, really integrate well into uh, Yarn. Uh, there are other vendors like SAS, uh, Revolution Analytics, which is of course now part of Microsoft, uh, SAP, uh, and others uh, who um, uh, bet on the YARN framework. It runs next generation workloads. That What that means is whether it is Spark, whether it is Solar, which is a search engine, whether it's Storm, which is a, you know, a distributed uh, uh, streaming platform, right? Um, uh, whether it's HBase, everybody can take advantage of Yarn, and everybody can uh, benefit from Yarn, right? So uh, the Yarn is in production for now several years at very very large organizations, and it's kind of battle tested. So here is a little bit more details of how Yarn is kind of um, uh, is the epicenter of the um, Hadoop platform um, and all the various technologies that can take advantage of Yarn. Now, how do you operate a Hadoop cluster, right? So uh, in, say, Windows world, you have a system center, right? Uh, a technological Ambari, which is like the system center of the, uh, uh, the modern data infrastructure platform, right? So uh, from a single pane of glass, you can deploy uh, various uh, components of your platform. You can um, manage your resources like nodes to network, to uh, memory uh, that various components use. You can apply various policies, right, and so on. So I'll actually show you a little bit of how to use it. And um, let me move along because I just have 20 minutes time, right? Um, so here is the streaming infrastructure which we are actually going to see in the demo. So I'm going to, instead of describing this slide, I'm going to uh, show you the actual demo and describe it there. Um, uh, and here is a very common um, architecture for uh, today's data platform. It's, it's often called the Lambda architecture. It's, uh, it was uh, proposed by Nathan Mars of Twitter, where you uh, divide up uh, your data infrastructure into three separate layers, the batch layer, the serving layer, and the speed layer. So batch layer is, uh, has your item port and store, so all your data that comes in uh, goes to that store, right? And then you have pre-computed views on it, right? But those pre -com those uh, computation of those views happen in batch. That's why it's called the batch layer, right? And then um, as they're uh, computed, uh, they can update the business views, which then can connect to uh, the query components like Excel or Tableau or any other dashboarding solution. But 
often time businesses wants to cut down on the latency from when the data lands to when they can see the insights or they can access the insights. So that's where the speed layer comes in, right? So as data is coming in, you can take decisions in real time. Um, of course, you can't do as deep analytics as you could in batch layer because deep analytics needs time. But you can, um, you know, um, uh, based on the batch layer, you can uh, configure your speed layer to do, um, you know, shallower analytics and but provide you timely results and uh, um, you know, with the incremental views, update your business views, which again is then exposed through the query uh, components. Now here is a much detailed uh, uh, kind of architecture diagram and I'll let you kind of, it's pretty self-explanatory, so I'll let, let you uh, explore this uh, later, but let me go back to the demo and if after the demo, we, if we have time, I can come back and explain this, uh, a deep dive into this a little bit more, right? So um, let's switch to the demo. So uh, here what I have, once you have the sandbox set up, if you go to uh, uh, port 8888, give me a second to load this. There you go. So this is what we call the splash page of the uh, sandbox. But this provides some interesting um, links. Uh, so if you go to this link, uh, 4200, uh, here I have gone here. So it provides a SSH uh, shell, right? So I, uh, I, when I provide my username password, then I can get login. And then I do, I'm doing a sudo hyphen s to kind of promote me uh, myself into root uh, so that I can uh, go through, walk through the various components in the lab, right? So uh, remember the document that I shared at the beginning of the presentation? So uh, once you log in here, you can follow that document to complete all those steps. Now this is Ambari, right? So this is... Uh, once uh, again, in on any Hadoop, Hadoop cluster, whether it's HD Insight or the Hortonworks Sandbox or HDP on Azure, it's the same management uh, environment, right? So this provides all the various components. Uh, I, in fact, I uh, uh, just before this session, just to save time, I in, um, uh, installed the NiFi component using action, add service, um, and you see that, uh, sorry about this, uh, NIFI is already checked, which means I have gone through the wizard and um, and uh, configured NIFI as a service on my uh, little cluster here. Uh, it also provides um, uh, various kind of views, like I can uh, do have a high view, basically I can type in SQL commands uh, and so on. Um, and I can also do various kind of configurations here uh, for various components. For example, these are some of the yarn configurations, right? So uh, again, if you want to know more, a very uh, useful place to go is hortonworks.com slash tutorials. Uh, they have plenty of tutorials around all these technologies. So uh, you'll be busy for quite some time just exploring the various components of Hadoop. But with that, uh, I because I uh, configured NiFi, let me go to the NiFi. Um, so uh, I go to the same public IP where my sandbox is running, and then port 9090 slash NiFi, I get a blank screen like this. It kind of looks like a visual screen, uh, So and, and it's meant to be like that. So the key thing to note in this thing is this, these are called processors. So if I drag this and drop this here, I'll see a list of things that I can do. For example, if I want to read a file, so I, see, I just search by file. Um, uh, so I see this one, get file. I can read a little bit more of what it does. And if I say add, um, it will drop that processor uh, on the screen. Now I can configure it. I can put in things like 
you know, what's the input directory? Let's say I put in temp, TMP, right? Um, uh, okay, and and apply, and and then I can put in another process, of which where the data will flow to. So in this case, let's say I want to do something very simple. I want to just store it into HDFS. So I say HDFS. So I say put HDFS is my command that I like. So you can see it's very drag and drop. So again, now I want to put uh, in the uh, 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 slash temp directory. The by the way, the ones which are in bold, they are the required fields. So I uh, I want to put in slash TMP on HDFS. So that is different from the uh, uh, slash TMP um, on the local file system. Now I can drag, drop, and connect this to, and say add. Now the you know I have a very simple data flow. But uh, you know let me actually uh, show you a more. Sorry about that. Who I inadvertently uh, hit the back button. I can delete this. Uh, and let me put in a uh, uh, in a more realistic uh, data flow, uh, which is a little bit more fun. So I can put in templates. So here, um, if you follow the instruction, I shared a template, I, which is basically an XML file. So I can say, okay, select this Twitter dashboard slash XML, and if I hit import, it will be imported. Now, which I have already done, so that's why it's showing up here. So once I've done this, um, I can go here and drop on my um, uh, on my uh, kind of uh, worksheet, and then I can say add, and here is my uh, Twitter dashboard group. Now it has a bunch of processors. If I double click on it, I can look at those. So I can again um, pinch to zoom, and all those things work. It's a very uh, this is an older UI actually. The newer UI is even more slicker. Uh, but having said that, so this is a, again a very simple data flow. What it does is it's grabbing data from Twitter, it's uh, uh, extracting some of the attributes, it uh, you know filters out any of the blank tweets or uh, corrupted tweets, and then uh, puts um, on one end puts it in Solar. Solar is, as you know, is a search engine, uh, and on the other hand, it kind of uh, reformats it so that we can put it in Hive and do interactive queries on it, and then uh, it does uh, uh, merges the content and then uh, it uh, stores it in the local file system as well as it's uh, storing in uh, in HDFS. Now, as you know, HDFS is a distributed file system which is kind of a network storage. Uh, in most cases, uh, and let's say there is, um, uh, you cannot be assured of the link between uh, where this is running, where HDF is running, and HDFS. So we have also configured it for retry. Now you can do all this simply without writing a sing single line of code, just by you know right clicking and saying configure and changing values essentially. So let me show you how I configure it actually. So let me go to um, uh, dev.twitter slash apps because I need the Twitter keys. So I have this uh, app set up. I'll go to the keys and tokens. And uh, here are all my keys. So um, I'll uh, let me copy this the consumer key um, and go to the workflow and go to properties and you see the consumer key here. Make sure you're copying it correctly, not copying it uh, kind of uh, uh, part of it. So again, this and here, consumer secret. And then go back and also uh, put the access tokens. I'm doing a live demo, so 
uh, there's always a chance uh, to do something wrong under pressure. Okay, and access token secret. Make sure you don't copy the space, right? So that's the thing I want you to be careful about. Access token secret. So I think we've caught all the bold ones. And um, so here is the other part. So I'm just uh, filtering on the tweets which has these keywords like AAPL, ORCL, GO, GMSFT, Dell, right? And I say apply. Now you see it had a kind of a triangle, yellow triangle with an exclamation point. Now it has turned solid red. At this point, if I click the play button, I can cl click the play button individually by selecting it. But if I click on the worksheet and say play, then it will start reading uh, from Twitter. We will soon know whether it's working or not uh, if we. Uh, see um, so it's uh, getting an error authorization required so again let me stop it I might have put uh, one of those uh, uh, things wrong so let me uh, redo it of oh, that's the you know so you know I'm doing a live demo now copy Okay. Consum secret. Starts with L and it's with J. Yep. And then the access tokens starts with seven, ends with X. Okay, not this one. So cancel C. Yeah, I think that's what uh, there was a mistake. I think like we overwrote consumer secret twice. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks, Easy. Easy. You're watching it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Closely. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Apply. Okay. Fingers crossed. Let's see. Play. Everything's playing. Let's see. See. Uh, it. I think it's a. Uh, okay. It's still. You have to give it some time. There you go. Uh, yeah. So So in fact, uh, you know, we can uh, see what's going on. I think it's uh, it's working. So as you can see, this is kind of writing out values so it's already written out 15 uh, tweets so you can inspect what's going on right so you go to data provenance and um, and see it's writing out all this stuff um, and then you can go to uh, one of this click here and go to content and you say view uh, so it's and you can have it formatted so this is JSON coming from uh, so it's a, uh, it's some kind of looks like a, uh, uh, a tweet about some show or something. I wasn't expecting when I was filtering on um, uh, all those technology company name, but uh, you know there must be those uh, words somewhere in here. But um, but it is working. So uh, let me explain while it's. Uh, in play as to what's happening here. So, in this key, this is the key thing that I want to explain. Uh, note here that here there are 21 uh, tweets which have come in, and only two has gone out. Right. The reason is, you know, 
we are in this one we are merging several tweets into a single file and then dropping it into HDFS because HDFS doesn't like a lot of small files it loves a few big files and and that's what we are doing right so uh, and, and you can see the similarly it's all going to solar as well and we can actually see what's going into solar because solar um, comes with a dashboarding technology called banana and hopefully this is kind of updating as we speak so in real time so fingers crossed live demo right see so the tweets are coming in so the top twitters are a uh, person live called Pozo Khaled Bakau Dove Danks Richard and so on so you can see uh, it started, the tweets are flowing in, what's the rate and so on. And you can customize this um, dashboard uh, to your heart's content and not just this, uh, because this is also going to HDFS, now you can pull up Hive, you can pull in Zeppelin, which is a dashboarding technology to do um, various kind of data analytics. In fact, talking about uh, sentiment analysis, we actually have a uh, tutorial on this same data so if you just scroll down the you know the the section above is just kind of what we have been doing but here if you come to the bottom uh, they actually walk you through how to use a zeppelin a notebook uh, which is basically running um, a hive query uh, getting the uh, getting all that data here and then uh, visualizing it right so you can do much more interactive what if analysis here so with that uh, I think I have four more minutes uh, we barely made it in time um, unless uh, there are other questions uh, is he, do we have some questions yes um, there's a question actually like um, in one of your slides you uh, covered a case study related to true cars right um, there you had like um, you brought uh, through optimization you brought the cost from 19 dollars per gigabyte to 12 cents a gigabyte or something right so the, the question is related to that like uh, uh, what is the typical data size for cost optimization that is whether customer would see cost benefit on 300 gigabytes enterprise data warehouse or 3 terabytes enterprise data warehouse uh, typically these are in uh, terabytes range that's where we see the most uh, cost savings but having said that a uh, lot of our customers get started early on uh, uh, on a smaller proof of concept so that they have uh, infrastructure which they know they can organically grow, right? So they, they, they can spin up a smaller HD Insight cluster on Azure and start kind of migrating some of the workloads there so that they know as they uh, are ready uh, to make it bigger and big, bet bigger and bring their main uh, data sets on they they have the right skills and 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 the right applications to go with it the other aspect is a lot of people use azure as um, uh, or hd insight on azure as a geo redundancy uh, uh, tactics so basically with um, uh, apache falcon you can set up a replica of your on prem hdp cluster on the blob store right so once you, let's say you have a, a big cluster on your uh, data center now you set up the uh, uh, incremental replica on the azure blob store as uh, and when you get spikes in demand for your um, data platform you can quickly bring uh, bring up a temporary hd inside cluster do that processing and as soon as uh, you know that uh, spike in demand goes away you can very easily tear it down and uh, without uh, incurring uh, constant uh, or uh, permanent cost infrastructure cost right so uh -huh. are there other questions um, I think like we're kind of uh, running out of time so okay. in case if um, if others have questions, yeah, please feel free to um, uh, send your questions uh, to Saptak. Um, we saw his uh, tweet handle earlier at Saptak. So feel free to send your questions. So absolutely, yeah. It was a uh, 
a great opportunity to present to you all. Uh, please keep in touch, and uh, I go to the next slide. Sure. Right. Um, and yeah, make sure to stay tuned for the next session using JSON with SQL Server 2016 with Steve Hughes. And uh, thank you all for attending, and look forward to seeing you all at the upcoming PASS Summit in October. Thank you. And thank you, sir. Fill in the survey. Yes. Yeah, your feedback is very important actually, so we can use that to um, see like how we can do better in case if you found some issues. So, thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.